Good afternoon. I'm Bettina Klan with NASA's Office of Communications. Welcome to our latest town hall with Administrator Jim Bridenstine. Today we have a very special guest, our new Associate Administrator for Human Exploration and Operation Mission Directorate, Douglas Lavero. As you know, we're trying to get a lot accomplished in human spaceflight, from returning the launch of American to the International Space Station on American rockets from American soil, to landing the first woman and next man on the moon by 2024 with the Artemis program. We encourage everyone across the agency to be part of this town hall discussion, and you can participate either through your mobile device or your desktop computer. Just go to nasa.gov slash town hall at the top of your browser. Once you get to your town hall website, you'll be asked to add which center you're participating from. Then you'll have the option to either ask your question or vote for a question that's already on the list. We'll be taking questions from those who have joined us here in the web auditorium at headquarters and from the town hall website. I'm sure this will be a great discussion. We look forward to your questions. So let's get started. Without further ado, let's introduce Administrator Jim Bridenstine. Well, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Bettina, thank you for, um, for that great intro into today's segment. Uh, we have a real pleasure today to, to meet our, our new associate administrator in charge of human exploration and operations. Um, and of course, this took a while, it took a while to get to today. Um, we did indeed a nationwide search. We looked high and low for the absolute best person that would fit this role. And of course, the, there's a lot that goes into it. We're talking about not just technical expertise, um, not just program management capability, but leadership, and also some political challenges. NASA gets its funding from Congress. This, whether we like it or not, sometimes we don't, don't like to admit it, but this is kind of a political organization. Maybe not partisan, and I'm very thrilled about that. We have bipartisan support, and we want to keep that. Uh, but we do have a lot of parochial interests. And so finding somebody with this very unique skill set um, that could fit this role uh, took a bit of time. But I do believe that we have found the right person in, in Doug Lavero. Um, I knew Doug when I was in the U.S. House of Representatives. At the time, he was the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Space Policy. Um, and I saw him make very impressive transformational changes uh, within DOD space policy. And he used his position uh, as DASD for space policy to actually affect programmatic change in a significant way that benefited our nation. I saw that firsthand as a member of the House of Representatives. So I will tell you, it's, uh, it took a bit to get here, but we are now here. We're grateful that you're here, Doug. And I'd like to start just by letting you share who you are, your background, where you come from, all the way back to maybe even your early days in the Air Force. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, inviting me into your family. I mean, this is a great, a great organization, one that I have admired my entire life, and I can truly, I can say that with all, all truthfulness. Uh, and so it's great to become part of uh, NASA. I've, I've practiced in the other two parts of space within the, uh, within the nation, the defense part of space and the intelligence part of space, so I guess you can say I've now won the trifecta um, because I'm now on the civil side of space. Um, so a fantastic, uh, a fantastic opportunity. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about myself for those of you in the audience who, who don't know me. Uh, I have spent 45 years in government service. I was out of the government for the last two and a half years uh, after the end of the Obama administration, but before that, my 45 years in, it was in the government as a, uh, as a uniformed military officer and then later as a civil servant. I think if I I think if I add in my time at the Air Force Academy, it might be a little bit more than that. Um, but, uh, but that's how I started my career, at the Air Force Academy. And as many of those in my generation, I began, I went to the Air Force Academy because I dreamed of going to space. I dreamed of being an astronaut at the time. Um, I found out that it's actually more fun to conceive of space and to build space than it is to fly it. And, and it probably is a lot of fun to fly, but since I don't get to do that, I'm going to pr presume it's more fun to build and conceive. <laughs> okay. Um, and, um, and it has just been a, uh, a, a fantastic career for me. I started off, my first space job was doing command and control of uh, space things for the United States uh, Air Force. Uh, I quickly went uh, to all sides of space. I uh, ran the MILSATCOM portfolio uh, for the Secretary of Defense, the Military Satellite Communications portfolio for the Secretary of Defense. I went out to the Space and Missile System Center, um, which is in Los Angeles. 
and I have a lot of great friends out there. Uh, and I ran uh, all the classified Air Force space programs. And then I ran the program that obviously everybody in the world knows and depends upon, uh, the GPS program. Now, before I get a bunch of questions on it, I am not responsible for the software on your phone that guides you in the wrong direction. I did the satellites, okay? The rest of it is up to Android, so it's not my fault. Um, and, uh, and I really, uh, and that was, a, that was a great introduction. And as Mr. Uh, as Mr. Bridenstine says, uh, the, the GPS program is one of those programs where you get to personally meet everybody in Congress, all the international partners, which we have here at NASA, because it affects the entire world, just as what we do here at NASA affects the entire world. After that, I uh, went to the National Reconnaissance Office, ran some uh, very big and aggressive programs at the National Reconnaissance Office, which is in charge of all of the intelligence um, classified satellites for the United States of America. Then I went back out to the Space and Missile Systems Center, where I oversaw the entire portfolio of space programs as the deputy to the commander uh, out there. And, and then I got a real opportunity to do things in space I hadn't done before. I got to work on launch efforts uh, there. We got to work on weather satellites, a lot of interaction uh, with NOAA and NASA uh, during uh, that time that we were working on um, the NPOS uh, program and the follow-ons to the NPOS program. So I got to work with folks at this organization already. By the way, don't, don't judge our new AA based on NPOS. I'll be really clear um, for those of you who are familiar. Uh, th right. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yes. Thank you for that. So, I, was in I was in charge of shutting down the program, which I'm not sure is good or bad. Um, but <laughs> Um, but we do as we were told. Um, so, uh, and, um, and, and then uh, in, my, uh, in my last uh, four years, uh, I was asked uh, by the Obama administration to come up and run space policy, which I felt like it was a job that I had been practicing for all of my career, uh, because when you do space programs, you're creating space policy. Um, and we do that as much in NASA here as we do within the DOD and the intelligence community. The things we do in space affect the entire world. They infect affect all of our citizens. They are of national importance. Every space program I've ever dealt with um, has, uh, it goes up to the White House, goes up to Congress. And so I view that as all 45 years of training. I am the, be the most overtrained I have ever been in my life at this stage. Um, I'm not sure I'm ready for this challenge yet, but I know, I, I know that, I, that you guys will help me along the way because I've got a great team in HEO uh, and they're going to go ahead and complete my training so I can go ahead and, get, and finish that trifecta uh, and, uh, and come and help in civil space. So that's good. Um, you mentioned MILSATCOM, that's where you started. Interestingly, when I was in the house, um, I think that's really where we first connected because uh, as, a, as a former Navy pilot myself, uh, I've seen at certain times in certain theaters, uh, we have SATCOM capacity available to us and we have weapon systems that have SATCOM needs but they're not compatible. Uh, you have commercial SATCOM, which is in C-band and KA lower, and you have military SATCOM, which is in X-band and KA upper. And guess what? They don't talk to each other. And we didn't build systems with you know, multi-band capacity. Um, so th those were kind of, I think, our early connections. Um, when I first started getting involved in space activities as a member of the House, that's where I started. And I think that's where we can. And you were talking about back then, how do we get how do we get frequency hopping? How do we get encryption into some of our commercial capabilities so that DOD can take advantage of them right. and not necessarily have to build those, those multi-band terminals? So um, yeah, I, I had forgotten that we, we had that connection. I also asked Doug back in the day when I was in the house, it wasn't that long ago, <laughs> uh, I asked him to come testify on the science committee regarding debris. Mm -hmm. And of course, I'll tell you, if I remember right, uh, it was uh, the, the National Space Symposium, which is now just the Space Symposium. Uh, you and I had a conversation, and you mentioned we were talking about debris regulation and how a lot of these companies don't like the regulation of debris. They don't like space traffic management. They don't want to be told that they have to maneuver a satellite. And you said, well, if they don't like regulation, wait until they run into a National Technical Means satellite. <laughs> I remember that just like yesterday. Mm -hmm. and I remember thinking, well, that's a good point. He's like, there won't be regulation. There's going to be a, a stop mm -hmm. to a lot of space activity. So, uh, yeah, share with us your, your background on that and, and certainly some of the things that are on your mind regarding debris. A absolutely. Um, so, you know, I, I want to I go on record here on, on, uh, on national, at least NASA TV, um, as I have uh, on, uh, on the record at the Congress. 
Um, I believe um, that, uh, that we are absolutely required to reduce debris uh, in space and that it, we, the U.S. should lead in that endeavor. Um, the U.S. should lead in that endeavor. And not just for civil space, for our commercial space partners. Um, debris is an is a, um, uh, a, a anchor on, the com on commercial progress we will make in space. Um, and we don't need that anchor. We need to free... We need to free our companies to do the things they need to do in space. We need to be able to support human spaceflight in space well into the future. Uh, and debris um, can very, be a very um, hazardous uh, problem in space if we don't control it. Uh, it, is a, it is in the U.S.'s economic and military interest to be a leader in the reduction of debris in space. Um, and I said that when I was over in the DOD, and I'll repeat that over here. Uh, in NASA, and I expect that to be something that, uh, that I hopefully can participate in Absolutely. Um, here as well. So we have uh, Space Policy Directive 3 um, that uh, puts, we actually have an agency directed by the administration, that being the Commerce Department, that's going to be responsible for space situation awareness, space traffic management. Now NASA is not, we don't want to be the regulator, that's our goal is to not be the regulator, but certainly we, we have an interest in making sure um, that debris is mitigated, um, and to the extent possible, we can do space situation awareness, space traffic management to keep our assets safe, to keep our astronauts safe. And then ultimately, we'd like to see a day when we can do remediation. A lot of our investments right now um, on the science side are focused on how do we do robotic servicing of satellites, Landsat 7, for example. So, um, so we do have a role to play there. It's a technological role. It's a capabilities role, not necessarily a regulatory role, and that's that's really what, what NASA does, does very well. Um, so share with us, when you think back to um, your days at SMC, um, are there any particular projects or programs that you can remember specifically where, where maybe NASA had an impact? Uh, well, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting. Uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have the head of the science division sitting in front of us uh, here. Um, and uh, he and I uh, had a discussion uh, just, uh, I think, last week. Uh, and one of my first interactions with, uh, with NASA was uh, when I was running what was called the Space Based Laser uh, Program at the time. And we teamed with NASA uh, in order to develop large mirrors, large mirror technology. That technology made its way into the James Webb uh, Space uh, Telescope. Um, and, uh, and, and we've had those kind of collaborations between the DOD, between the intelligence community, and NASA from the beginnings of space, from the very beginnings, from the very first moments. All of the first, um, the earliest NASA missions were flown on Air Force rockets. Uh, it, was, uh, it was Thor and Athena and those kind of rockets that flew our early missions. So the collaboration between DOD and NASA has always been a key element of our nation's space underpinnings. And yet we have separate missions uh, and we have to respect those separate missions. Our job is a civil job. Our job is science and exploration um, and human endeavor and the job of the DOD is to keep all of us safe every day in the intelligence community to make sure they can let our leaders know what's happening in the world. Those jobs come together in the technology. We collaborate all of the time, but we have three separate missions. That's great. What I'd like to do, if it's all right, um, can, we go to, can we go to questions either from the audience or online and um, just kind of open it up? Yeah, we'll take a question from the audience and we'll pull up the questions from online on the screen in the moment. Um, question from the audience? By the way, you guys need to, I need to see 10 hands go up when you question. <laughs> there you go, we got, we got a taker. So good afternoon. I was wondering if you could comment a little, Doug, on your leadership style and some traits that you think are important for teams to meet you know, kind of challenging goals. Well, thank you. You know, um, Administrator Bridenstine said it when he was doing the introduction, there's many roles, there's many reasons um, that you select people for being in this role, and one of them is leadership. Uh, and and to me, that's the most important reason. Um, that is what we are. I, I have not turned a bolt in 40 years, and I don't anticipate turning any in this, in this job. Um, my job is to support the people who work for me, um, to go ahead and make sure they have the tools they need, whether it's turning a bolt or creating a contract or whatever the tool it is. And, and my job as the leader is to support them in that. My job as the leader is to enable them. My job as a leader is to give them vision and to give them purpose, to make them understand uh, that, that the work that they're doing is critically important every day and that we above them appreciate that every day. 
Um, I'm a cheerleader. Um, I, I'm, I'm certainly a, a teacher. I'm a mentor. I, I pride myself um, in mentoring um, folks that work for me uh, during the career. I have many, many, many uh, young generals who used to work for me uh, now. And it's hard to say young generals, but at my age, I get to say young generals. Um, and, uh, and, and so leadership is about giving people's life purpose, giving their work purpose, and making sure they are happy and fulfilled every day they come to work. Uh, and so that, my leadership style is to try to do that. That's not really a direct answer on style. That's sort of a, more of an answer on what I try to achieve. I'm a, I'm a smiling person. Um, that's who I am. I, 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 I've been smiling since the earliest photos of me when I was a child. I don't know why. I'm, I'm not sure what the joke is, but I have, but apparently get it. Um, because because by, by, being, by being pleasant and smiling, everybody about, around you is pleasant and smiling. Um, and it really does help to change the morale of folks to the positive, uh, which is uh, something I pride in the organizations that I lead. Um, so I hope that gives you a little sense of who I am. The only way you'll be able to decide if I'm a good leader or not is after you've lived with me for a year yeah. and decide whether or not I have lived up to the promise that I've just given you. I'll tell you, as, as a former member of Congress, um, I, I saw him take the lead on a number of issues, uh, not the least of which was what at the time we were calling the Space Corps. Uh, in the House of Representatives, it wasn't the Space Force, it was a Space Corps like the Marine Corps reports to the Navy, the Secretary of the Navy. The Space Corps would report to the Secretary of the Air Force. Uh, Doug was an early leader on these kind of initiatives. Um, and it has, it has kind of evolved from where he started to where it is now. Um, but without him starting these dialogues in the House of Representatives among people on both sides of the aisle about what, what the real threat is, what the challenge is, how to, how to meet those threats, the capabilities and limitations, and spending time with the key policymakers, the key decision makers, and leading them to a conclusion to where when we passed the Space Corps in the House, we got 344 votes, strong bipartisan support. Um, Doug should get a lot of credit for that. Um, of course, there's a lot of people involved, um, but Doug certainly deserves a lot of credit for making us aware of the history. <laughs> I like what you said. You're a teacher. You are a teacher. Mm -hmm. You spent a lot of time making us understand where did the Air Force come from and making us, un and by the way, I knew that because I'm from the Navy, <laughs> but a lot of members of Congress didn't. Mm -hmm. um, but there's, there's a reason that we created the Air Force in 1948, and there's a reason that there's a time when we need to have a new force for a new domain. Mm -hmm. And, and um, you were very, very adept at, at uh, leading our nation in that way when you were DASD for space policy. Mm -hmm. All right, more questions? Yeah, so we have the questions from IO from the nasa.gov backslash town hall on the screen. Okay. So we'll answer some of those and also take some from the, the audience. So I'll keep all right. you, Jim. All right, I'm gonna turn around here if that's all right. Let's see, with new funding stalled, how does Moon 2024 differ from the other times Lucy has pulled the football away from the workforce? <laughs> I'll tell you this, Doug, we do not have shy employees here at NASA. <laughs> uh, so, I'll, this is, look, this is about Doug. I'm going to take this one. We're going to knock some of these down here that are probably more focused on me. The, the key here is, um, know this, we have strong bipartisan support in both the House and the Senate. Uh, it was just a few months ago, I was out at the Ames Research Center in California, and I did Women's Equality Day with the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. And she looked right at me as I sat in the audience, in front of hundreds of people, cameras rolling, and said, we're all counting on you to get the first woman on the moon. And then she also said, in, a, in the press conference, she said, Mr. Administrator, um, you honor us with your presence. And she said, I'm so glad that you called the program Artemis, which is named after the Greek goddess of the moon. And she said, we're so, we're so glad that you're willing to do that. So th this is, I think, a, a, a program that has strong bipartisan support. Um, I will also tell you that we have a funding bill that came out of the Senate committee, uh, the Commerce Justice Science Committee uh, in the Senate, with zero opposition that included funding for landing on the moon. With zero, zero opposition. That means the Democrats were all in favor of it. And of course, we have strong leaders on both sides of the aisle that made that happen. So I, I will say 
we're not out of the woods. There, there is no doubt getting appropriations in this time is difficult. But it is also true that we have until December 20th, and I've talked to a number of folks on the Hill that are, that are working very hard to see some mini buses come to the floor and that want to see NASA in one of those mini buses at the levels necessary to keep us on track to land on the moon in 2024 under the Artemis program. So I think this, um, this, this, is, this is something that we are, as a nation, capable of doing. It's going to be up to us and some of us in this room to move forward and inspire the nation because this isn't political. It's not partisan. Don't get me wrong. When you talk about appropriations these days, everything gets bogged down and everything else. It all gets tied together, and the next thing you know, things don't happen that you thought were a slam dunk. But this is something that should be easy. We need all members on both sides to get a win out of it, and I think that they, I think they'll see it that way. Do you have any comments, Doug? Uh, you know, I, I think I, I absolutely agree with everything you've said there. But in, in my, in my way of thinking, is we can't use um, funding as the crutch upon which we say we can't make the objectives we've been asked. Um, our job is to create the vision um, that allows us to get to the moon. Um, to convince Congress that the program they're supporting is one they really want to support, which I think is already, uh, is already a given. Uh, and to have the imagination to figure out how, because we're not going to get every dollar we've asked for every year, but have the imagination to figure out how we treat funding just like we treat any other issue that comes up in the program. We are going to have technical issues, engineering issues, science issues. Um, we are going to have issues across the board, and funding is one of those issues we can't let that be the single determinant of success. Good. All right, what is the agency's plan for when the majority of the workforce retires in the next five years? Important skills aren't being handed down. Hiring processes are the slowest they've ever been. Civil servants are being replaced by contractor temp hires. What's the plan here? Again, not a, not a shy workforce. Um, <laughs> I, I will tell you, um, I, I think it's important to remember, uh, uh, Doug, you have. I'm yeah, sure. and, and I can't sit down while my boss is standing, so I'm going to have to stand up too. <laughs> right. so, um, so, you know, uh, it, it's, uh, I, I told some folks um, earlier today we had the same dynamic uh, when we were out of the Space and Missile Systems Center. Uh, folks came to me, the personnel folks came to me when I got there at the beginning. I spent five years there. They, ca they, got, they came to me at the beginning. They said, half the workforce can retire in the next five years. And you know what? They didn't. And you know why? Because they love the work. They love the work. I, look, I've retired twice from government service. I'm back here, <laughs> right? You know, so I was about to start and file for Social Security, but I, there's, I'm, I'm back here because this work is fun. It's, and it's important. How could you find anything better to do in life than work that is fun and important? And to me, that keeps people in well beyond. We don't have... We don't have clock punchers in NASA. We don't have clock punchers in DOD space. We don't have folks who are waiting for that day that they can say, ah, got my pension, I'm out of here. Uh, most people are, th their fingernails are dragging uh, down the carpet as their spouse pulls them out of NASA and says, time, <laughs> time to do something else. So, so I, I, uh, I, think, um, I think that uh, while we absolutely, and let's make no question about it, we absolutely must go ahead and prepare the next generation uh, for leadership at NASA. Uh, I am not fearful of everybody walking out the door tomorrow. It's just not going to happen. So. Yeah, I, I think I agree with all that. I would also say uh, in November we kicked off the Strategic Workforce Development Initiative for NASA. Um, there's a lot of things on the, on the table there. Of course, we want more direct hire authority. Uh, we're getting that now from not just the administration, but also maybe put into law. There's, there's different proposals in law for that. So there's a lot of different ways that we can mitigate the pending gap, but I think you're right. Uh, the gap, while there is a bow wave of eligible uh, people re eligible for retirement, I don't think it necessarily means that there's going to be retirement. We do need to be prepared, um, and of course, that's going to require leadership, mentorship, training the next generation, getting those people ready to take on these um, these critically important jobs of the future. Um, let's see. Uh, there was okay. I want to. I had a different one up there. I'll go to the next one here. The SLS is projected to cost at least $2 billion per flight. Commercial heavy lift launch vehicles currently under, develop, uh, under development, such as SpaceX, Starship, and Blue Origin New Glenn, are projected to cost a fraction of the SLS per launch and be reusable. How can the SLS compete with the commercial vehicles, and how can the high cost be justified uh, in an era of constrained NASA budgets? C real quick, and I'll turn it over to Doug. Uh, 
I, I, I do not agree with the $2 billion number. It is far less than that. I would also say that um, the number comes way down when you buy more than one or two. Um, and so I think at the end, we're going to be you know, in the $800 million to $900 million range. I don't know, honestly. Um, we have recently just begun negotiations on what number three through whatever we, and we don't have to buy any, quite frankly, but we intend to. Um, but we're looking at what we could negotiate to get the best price for the American taxpayer, which is my obligation as the head of NASA. So if you want to take on any of those other challenging um, questions that were part of that. A absolutely. You know, uh, the word competition was used up there, competing, as if SLS is competing uh, with commercial space. I don't view that as all the dynamic. Um, I think this is, a, this is a large ecosystem of space capabilities, and we need every capability that the nation is going to provide, whether the nation provides it through government funding, as SLS is, or uh, through entrepreneurial and commercial funding, uh, such as for New Glenn and for uh, Starship. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is the only system we have today that is designed, purpose-built, to go ahead and get men to the moon and women to the moon uh, is uh, the SLS. Um, that program is absolutely mandatory, in my view, right now, to go ahead and get there. But we, we have so much other work to do uh, to go ahead and get payloads to the moon, to get cargo to the moon, to prepare the surface for when those folks arrive. And we have a long, um, a long plan for exploration that will require us to go ahead and utilize the best U.S. industry can provide. Um, so I, I refuse to view it as an either-or. Um, certainly, we will make decisions along the way as to what makes most sense um, as developments of all of those systems uh, come forward. But, uh, but we've got to go ahead and right now uh, focus on the one that we have designed specifically for the mission, and then we will evaluate as we move forward how many of them that do we need, um, how do we go ahead and integrate commercial into there. I think this is a multifaceted answer, not a monolithic answer. I, I agree with everything you just said. I also would say that the 2024 deadline, the idea that we go fast, necessitates that we all work together. Um, SLS, we, we cannot get there without SLS. Everybody knows that. And we don't want SLS to just one day stop after all of this investment. At the same time, to go in 2024, we're going to need to aggregate capability at the gateway. That, that capability could be delivered commercially. It could be delivered by one of the rockets mentioned in the question. So when we go fast and when we see increasing budgets, which we have seen, um, there's going to be lots of opportunity for all of the players to have lots of success and enable all of us to do more. So I think, I think your holistic approach is, is right on. All right, so the next one is about climate change. Um, NASA should lead on technology and help develop sustainable energy solutions. A couple of things on this. Um, number one, and this, I'm sorry, it, it's not your question. <laughs> so people need to know, and, and, and this is absolutely true, our Earth science budget is today as high as it's ever been. And under my leadership, I have worked very hard to make sure everybody understands the, the importance of that earth science budget. Because the climate is changing. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. Um, and we need to make sure that we are leading when it comes to doing the science and the technology that is necessary to inform decision makers as to how the earth is changing. And you have heard me say before, I said it when I was in the house. Um, when you look at the Arctic ice alone, I'm a Navy pilot by trade. <laughs> We, we, have, we are now in a position where we have to defend the Arctic. That didn't used to be the case, but the ice isn't there anymore. So the Earth is changing. That can't be denied. The question is, what does NASA do? Well, we study it, and there's a lot that we don't yet know. And we're going to continue to take all of that data from all of those great um, Earth science capabilities, and we're going to share that data with the world for free. That's what we're going to do. Now, I will also tell you, I have to be really careful. Because we have strong bipartisan support right now, and here's what we need to do. We need to dispassionately follow the science, dispassionately get the data, and make sure that science and data is available to the world for free. But what we don't want to do, and this is not in our job description, is tell policymakers what they need to do in response to what NASA's data says. We dispassionately collect the science. We don't delve into the politics of policy related to what to do about what we're learning. That's for somebody else. Um, so know this. I am committed to earth science. We have been committed to earth science. Our earth science budget is as high as it's ever been. It hasn't gone down a dollar since the, um, the, the Trump administration took office. I've been committed 
to doing what I can to protect it, and we'll continue to do that. So, Jim, if okay. we can, we we'll see if we have any audience. questions in the audience. I guess they all ask them online. I know. Online. Everybody's really, everybody's <laughs> really bold online, I've noticed. <laughs> <laughs> all right, what do we we'll got We'll continue next? with IO, yeah. <laughs> all right, what, what role will NASA play in the DOD's newly formed Space Force? <laughs> Doug, you have any ideas on that one? I, I will. I, it's a really one-word answer, none. Um, so, but, um, I, but let me add on to that. So first of all, as I've already said, um, we have two sides, three sides of space within, within the nation. We have... Uh, we have intelligence space, we have DOD defense space, and we have civil space. They are separate mission areas. The Space Force uh, does not go ahead and impact NASA directly, but it does indirectly. Um, and, and I'll tell you why, in my opinion, it does indirectly, and it's part, of, it's part of the reason why I think we needed the Space Force. It used to be there was a revolving door, which sometimes has a bad context, but in this case is a good context. There was a, vol a revolving door uh, between NASA and the Air Force in moving people back and forth to go ahead and share lessons that have been learned in these different diverse environments together. I always like to remind uh, people that the space shuttle program was run by an Air Force three-star general, James Abramson. The lunar lander program was, was run uh, by Sam Phillips. Um, these are General Sam Phillips, Major General Sam Phillips. These are were Air Force leaders who were the top of their game. When NASA went out to look for people to run their space programs at the time, back in the 60s and the early 70s, they found that some of the best people were folks who had learned their skills on the DOD side of space and wanted them on this side, and then sent them back to take the lessons they had learned here back to the DOD. And I, I for one, um, would love to restart that revolving door. I think the Space Force is part of that to create the leaders that we can engage back here at NASA and use the shared intelligence that we all have in space to go ahead and get this job done. You know, um, I was, I was uh, privileged to um, be sworn in yesterday uh, by Administrator Bridenstine um, in, in front of uh, many of you um, in the audience today um, and took that oath. But you know, it's the same oath, exactly the same oath, with exactly the same words that I took when I was in uniform because we're all part of the same team. Um, we, we may have different roles and missions during parts of our career, but we're part of the same team. Space Force helps build that other team. Uh, you know, maybe it probably would demean them by saying they're the, they're the minor leagues, our major leagues. Uh, that's probably not fair. Mm. Uh, but we certainly want to bring players up, and we want to send players that side um, as well, because uh, that's how we make sure we get done what the nation needs to get done. You know, I think there's a, there is another role that is indirect that we play, and that is, and uh, you know, of course, there's a lot of technology overlap, no, no question about that. But there's another role, I think, um, when you, I've heard General Hyten um, say in the past um, that you can't deter in the black. And when you talk about a lot of the DOD capabilities, they're, they're in the black. They're, they're classified programs. And you can't deter in the black. So what, where does NASA play in this? Well, we can, we can do stunning achievements to show the whole world our capabilities that we want the whole world to see, free and open. And in fact, we could go back and talk about maybe historically, um, the, you know, we talk about the Strategic Defense Initiative. Um, I presume you might have been involved in that, or at least? I was. I, I, I say I presume, I don't know. <laughs> You're probably too young for that, I don't uh, know. <laughs> um, no. But, but I, would, I would say the Strategic Defense Initiative, w at the end of the day, it was a great you know, idea, a great initiative. It got belittled by a lot of people. People said it wasn't technologically feasible, it was too expensive, um, it'll never happen. They called it the Star Wars program to try to belittle it. Um, but what, what was interesting is people around the world took it very seriously, including the former Soviet Union. And eventually it became a piece of the ultimate collapse of the Soviet Union because they invested so heavily to mitigate against it, even though we did not, in the end, invest on it. So the question is why? Why did it have so much credibility? I really believe that it had a lot of credibility in other nations because they saw that just maybe 12 or 13 years prior, we had people walking on the surface of the moon an achievement that others had tried and failed at, and we did it six times with 12 people. So I think that we do have a role to play in national security where we demonstrate amazing capabilities that deter threats, because they know that if we're doing this in the white, what are we doing you know, in classified programs? Exactly. So I think there's a role to play there. Yeah. 
Um, okay, so uh, Mr. Bridenstine, why did you remove Mr. Gerstenmeier from this position? Another great question. I want to be really clear. Uh, we love Bill Gerstenmeier. Um, and I will also say that um, he, he is not gone. He still works for NASA. He's the senior advisor to the deputy administrator, and he's still doing great work on behalf of the agency. I will also say he was in this job for 13 years, which, by the way, is about 10 years more than the average person is in this job. Not that I'm saying you're going to be a short-termer. <laughs> um, but, but you get my point. 13 years is a long time. And it's also true that in those years, a lot of it was during a time of constraint where, where budgets were actually going down. And he managed, I think, excessively well in that environment to try to hold all the pieces together. Um, and then there came a time when now our budgets are going up. Um, and, and it was time, in my view, to, to, to find a leader that had a long history of making programs run on schedule and on budget. And I think Doug is that kind of leader, not to take anything away from Bill Gerstenmaier. He did amazing things for our country. He's still doing amazing things for our country. But, but we have had a number of IG reports, a number of GAO reports. We've had a lot of challenges for members of Congress. We need to get on budget and on schedule. Um, and, and I think you know, we needed somebody who has a history, a long history, of making programs meet schedule and budget. And I think Doug Lavero is that kind of leader. And sir, if I could just say yes. something. I mean, you know, and I said this in my welcome letter to many of you yesterday. We are poised where we are today to succeed in what the president and the nation has asked us to do because of the work that Bill did um, to, within, within HEO. And I, I would love to give him a round of applause here mm -hmm. because I <laughs> think he's done <laughs> just an amazing job. Thank you for that, Doug. Okay, Artemis lacks the congressional support required to make it a reality. For how long will NASA continue to pretend otherwise? <laughs> so, to be clear. That's a softball question. We do have, <laughs> like I said, the bill that came out of committee in the Senate had zero opposition. Now, will that happen in the Senate at large? It depends what it gets mixed with. <laughs> but we do have strong bipartisan support. We have public statements from the Speaker of the House saying she wants to see this happen. And I want to make it happen. It should be part of her legacy. It should be part of the legacy of all members of Congress. And I really do believe that by December 20th, we have a, we have a strong probability of getting into an omnibus um, that will fund us for the rest of the year. Now, make no mistake, I've seen these things go south before. And I might have been a part of a process or two where it went south. <laughs> um, but that being said, I think that right now we're in a good position to get, um, to get an appropriation bill by, by December 20th. Okay, programs are working towards unrealistic launch dates. Okay, putting extreme pressure on employees to work towards milestones that the programs are not mature enough to complete. Wow, this sounds like... <laughs> All right, employees are sacrificing time with their families and health in some cases, dedicating hours, extra hours to these unrealistic dates. How will the administration work towards more realism and launch dates to give relief to employees and increase work-life balance in these programs? Great question, a couple of things, um, and I'll let Doug talk to it here in a second. Um, I, I, would, I would say very clearly that we, that we have done lots of surveys from the government as to the best places to work in the federal government. Um, the number one place in the federal government where people find the highest job satisfaction is right here at NASA. And the reason for that is because of the leaders that are not only in this room, but the, but the program managers, the center directors, all of the people across NASA that care about their employees. And we cannot, we cannot dismiss the results. Um, the results have been very clear. NASA is the best place to work, and, by, and by, by the way, by a large margin. Nobody else is even close. That being said, clearly there's somebody here who might feel like they have maybe some, need some help. And I will tell you as a family, we ought to be helping this person or others like it who feel like they've got too much pressure on them. Um, and guess what? We have the capability to help. And I, I encourage everybody here to look for people like this and help them out. Mm -hmm. Doug, do you have a thought? I absolutely agree with what you said, sir. And, you know, I think it's an incorrect dichotomy to suggest that we either have to go ahead and have a family life or we have to make schedule and that we can't have both at the same time. Um, that's, to me, that's just untrue. Uh, now, I'm probably the pot calling the kettle black because I, I work long hours, um, but I also enjoy my family and I, enjoy, I had my granddaughters here with me uh, today, uh, yesterday. Uh, and, um, and we spend a lot of time together. 
but I also spend a lot of hard time at work, and, and I think everybody here enjoys going ahead and working hard, and everybody here enjoys their families. Uh, and we all have a different balance to achieve, uh, but we don't need to sacrifice families to make schedule. Look, there's always a rush when you're in the middle of a launch countdown, which might go a week or so um, to go ahead and have to work those extra hours. Uh, but the real, the real situation is, is that all things we do in life take work, and we have to balance the two of them. Uh, and, peop and it's our responsibility as leaders, I think, as Mr. Breidenstine said, to make sure people are balancing their time. We don't have to sacrifice our schedule and ask people to sacrifice their families. That would be the incorrect thing to do. And I would, you know, I would also add, when, when I was um, not just interviewing Doug, but calling all of your references, and by the way, I called a bunch of references you didn't know, uh, <laughs> but we know a lot of the same people, so I, I, would, I would call. The one thing that I heard over and over again, without exception, is that you will never find anybody that works harder than Doug Lavera. Um, and, and, and I will tell you, I, I saw that when I was in the house. He was working relentlessly on accomplishing the goals of our national space policy. It, it is also, I think, true um, that what we do is unique and it requires maybe a different level of commitment. And I, I don't say this, I'm not talking about doing anything that would be problematic, but we are talking about doing civilization changing activities. That's what we're talking about. And that might not be for everybody, um, but at the same time, I'll tell you, the people that I know and work at this agency are the brightest, are the hardest working, are the most impressive, um, and you don't have to go very far to find that here at this agency. So we are very grateful to have this, this workforce. <laughs> you guys. Jim, Administrator, sir. Yes. We have yeah. a few questions okay, here in the good. audience. Audience question. Yeah. Good. Dr. Zerbukid. Sit down. Sit down, Doc. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit hard one, I can tell. I uh, no, no. <laughs> uh, look, uh, I have uh, one comment and two questions. And the first one, comment is just. Real quick, we let everybody know who you are. Oh, yeah, I'm Thomas Zerbukid, okay. head of science, okay. um, associate administrator for science. Uh, look, I just want to congratulate you and wish you all the best for this amazing job. I want to tell you that just like from the beginning when I stepped in this, uh, which is the only th time I really know in this agency, we will be partners, mm -hmm. full partners with what you're trying to do. We'll do everything we can to help uh, achieve this amazing agency, achieve the amazing goal that uh, we have in front of us. So, so we will do that. So first question is going to be an easy one. Tell us about your pin. My, my pin, ah. So, um, so this pin uh, says uh, 1,855 on it today. Yesterday it said 1,856. Um, this is uh, my D minus pin to the end of 2024, December 31st, 2024. Uh, that's how much uh, time that we have to go ahead and achieve the nation's goals. Some people have commented to me that um, this, is this can create launch fever. Well. Um, if this is launch fever, then I'm feeling pretty healthy right now. Um, uh, but seriously, um, that's not the intent here. That's not the intent to show people we're under the gun. The intent here is not to go ahead um, and, and tell people to rush. The intent here is to say, make every day count. Make every day count. Do something every day that helps us achieve our mission even more. Um, every day is important, every one, every, as every one of us are. Um, and if every individual make something happen every day that helps us achieve our mission, this is going to be easy. It is going to be easy to make this happen. So this is a reminder that every day counts. Well, um, so um, in my workshop, I have uh, many experimental models um, uh, down that I've, that I've cut up. Uh, and uh, I am still working on, uh, on, well, you know, now that you're going to have to pay me for because uh, uh, the amount of time I spend on this is not included in my salary. <laughs> so so um, I, I actually, I would love, uh, uh, this is, this is I, I'm not sure I'm allowed to, to say this, but I would love to find others who would like to make these pins because I would love to order pins for all of us. But I do not want to encourage anybody to take me up on that unless you personally, absolutely, in your gut, want that and then we'll figure out a way to make it happen. So. I'll tell you, I, I, I was
thrilled when I saw that yesterday. It shows a level of commitment uh, to, to the Artemis program that uh, we need and that uh, I think it inspires the workforce. So mm -hmm. thank you for wearing it. So yeah. I'm going to ask the harder question. Which is, I mean, I love one too. <laughs> when, when you're ready, you found your business. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, let's see. The, uh, the other question is really the one that we spend a lot of time with. And I think it, it's really important that you answer it here. In what way can science help human exploration in that amazing uh, goal? Absolutely. Uh, and Thomas, uh, thank you. I, I, I got to meet Thomas about just about a month, a little more than a month ago, I think. Um, and, uh, and I already can tell we're going to be great partners uh, in this uh, journey together. Um, it, is, it is fun to find somebody as passionate as me about what they, uh, about what they do. And, uh, and to me, uh, there is an absolute natural affinity between the purpose of exploration and the purpose of science. We do that together. Uh, and Believe me, I am going to depend upon science to get done the things that I can't get done um, because uh, you, you are the experts. Um, we need to find resources on the moon. I don't know how to do that. You know how to do that. Uh, my job will figure out how to go ahead and extract them later for, our, for use, but that's a science, that's a science job. Uh, science job um, has to do with all of the science on radiation. You, the Parker Solar Probe today is going to give us just reams of data about how much radiation we can expect on our journey to Mars. And make no mistake about it, we may be focused in 1,855 days on the moon, but Mars lies just beyond. Uh, and so we absolutely need to have partners. There are, there are critical science questions I'm not even sure we've thought of yet that have to be answered. Uh, and, and SMD uh, will be in the lead in all those. And I'm going to depend upon uh, our, um, our collaborative um, friendship to go ahead and get that done. So thank you, Thomas. So I think this is a great legacy um, issue um, with Bill Gerstenmaier. He, I mean, he really embraced the idea that science and exploration were not distinct and separate. And of course, I know Thomas has been leading on this as well. But there has been a history in the agency where people did. And by the way, even in the House today and in the Senate, people create these, uh, these dichotomies that are not helpful. And I, I will say that when we do have an architecture for human exploration around the moon and on the surface of the moon, all of a sudden our ability to do science goes way up. Astrophysics missions in orbit around the moon using the communication architecture from the moon, that, that means the, the, the cost of a science mission goes down. That means we can get more science for less, less, less cost. Uh, we talk about not just the astrophysics from the moon on the far side where it's very quiet, but also the science of the regolith itself, which, I mean, the, the, the moon is a repository of impacts for billions of years. Those impacts are asteroids. Those impacts are also subatomic charged particles from the sun. So there's, it, the moon itself is, is, is heliophysics. It's astrophysics. It used to be part, according to a lot of scientists at this agency, the moon was likely a part of the Earth at one point. That being the case, we can learn a lot about the Earth by going to the moon and seeing maybe it, what, what the early Earth might have been like. There's all kinds of reasons to go to the moon from a science perspective and, of course, tying it all together in a way where both science and human exploration um, benefit greatly from the collaboration is, is something that um, we need to really be communicating on a lot. And I know we've got great leaders here doing that now. Mm -hmm. So we, right, have, do we have time more? for one more question. Okay, one more. And then we'll go to remark, um, closing okay. remarks. So if you want to... Oh, from the... Okay. All right, how does NASA, okay, let's go to Mr. Douglas Levero, <laughs> your predecessor, <laughs> William Gerstenmaier, heard several major technical dissenting opinions by NASA engineers regarding the first two Artemis missions with the integrated Space Launch System and Orion and with respect to flight risk. Mr. Gerstenmaier listened to these carefully, wrote and, and issued detailed minutes and assigned substantial actions to the NASA programs. Are these in limbo, or are you actively reviewing these for possible future actions? Thank you. Sure. So, um, great question. Uh, by no means are any of these uh, questions in limbo. Now, I'm, in, I'm on hour 26 of my uh, NASA flight, so I can't tell you that I have reviewed, um, have reviewed all of these uh, as of now. Um, but every one of them, uh, I think, are important, uh, are certainly important questions uh, to answer. I have seen the testimonies. I've read the stories. Uh, I have not personally been in the meetings. But certainly I know about it, a, lot of the, a lot of the concerns. And I think we need to satisfy ourselves that we've got the right answer. And if we don't have the right answer, then we'll change. Then we'll make changes. That's, that's part of, back to the question of leadership that was asked earlier, part of the questions of leader, part of, one of being a leader is being willing to admit that we have to change the plan 
and not just slavish, slavishly, I'm not sure I can say that very well, um, but as a slave, uh, go ahead and follow just because it's written down. Uh, I think we've got a good plan. Uh, I think we will, that we will find elements of the plan that have to be changed. We will find comments that are critical to incorporate from, outsi from outsiders. And, we should, and I quite frankly invite those. My job over the next three months is to examine all of those things, is to, is to figure out um, where we are, where we are on the baseline of the program, what do we need to go ahead and modify, what do we need to change in order to go ahead and even raise even more our chances of success. Awesome. All right. Well, I just, uh, Doug, thank you for Sir? taking your lunch hour. And everybody here, thank you for taking your lunch hour. Um, we do this, uh, obviously, because folks on the West Coast are watching, and it's not their lunch hour, so we, uh, we're taking the bullet on this one. Uh, but I, I'll say it's, uh, it's been a, a real pleasure sharing the stage with you and hearing some of your thoughts and getting to know you better. Um, you have my full support. Thank you, sir. Um, as, as you're aware, I, I end up traveling a lot. I'm sure on a lot of those you know, missions, you're going to be going with me on those, on those trips. And in many times, we're going to be working separately from each other. Mm -hmm. That's why we've got Steve Jerzyk. <laughs> he's, uh, he's going to be, he, he is the, the, basically the chief operations officer for the agency. Um, and we're looking forward to, to you and he getting to know each other and working together, um, as well as working down and in and getting to know the center directors and all the different programs. Um, and I just, uh, I hope everybody in the agency knows um, that we have a person here who has experience, who has spent a lot of time working on programs uh, for other agencies, and, and he has met schedule and he's met budget uh, in a very effective way. Um, and he's done it um, as, as a junior officer all the way up to uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of, Secretary of Defense for Space Policy. He's operated at every level of, of the federal government. Um, but interestingly, he's not operated at NASA yet. <laughs> yeah. um, and, now, and now he's going to have that opportunity. And, and uh, we're, we're absolutely thrilled to have you here. And we look forward to all the great work that you're about to do. Thank so, you, Doug, sir. any closing comments? Uh, uh, sir, it's hard to follow that up. Um, this is, um, look, this is the pleasure and, and excitement of my career. Um, I, I could not have passed this up and could have asked for a, a better opportunity and, quite frankly, a, a better leader. Uh, to come uh, to come work for at this uh, at this incredible incredible time for our nation, uh, we are going to wow the nation um, just as we have in the past, uh, and I'm going to be so happy to be able to say that I was part of that. So thank you all for awesome. welcoming. Thank you, Doug. Me.